Welcome back to Bluegrass. It's a beautiful September afternoon. I'm out with Bear. And uh, the cameraman has a giant spider that just went up on her. Oh my gosh, she's going to freak out. Cameraman, show him this giant spider. You ready? Okay. Oh. That was, no. look, that was on the cameraman. <laughs> it's a good thing that I got that off of her because she would have freaked out. Okay, show him that dog. Uh, guys, last month I posted a little short and I asked you uh, what kind of dog bear was and a lot of people got half of it right, right? A Bernese Mountain Dog something. Uh, well, it turns out that bear is a Bernese Mountain Dog Australian Shepherd cross and we are pleasantly surprised with how that cross turned out. Uh, it's a really good dog, okay? And what we're showing you today, okay bear, is, um, you know, like how important it is to go into high distraction environments, okay, and make your dog understand that being, being compliant on the leash leads to freedom, okay? Because one of the most common, you know, problems that dog trainers see, one of the most, you know, one of the most profitable things in the dog business, right, is dogs pulling on the leash when people take them out into public or take them out into the woods or whatever, you know, hiking. And the reason being is because you're always, like when you go out, You've been doing your basic obedience usually in a relatively sterile, low distraction environment, and then all of a sudden you go out and there's scat on the ground, there's urine on every tree, there's uh, you know bird feathers and pieces of birds where the coyotes have been eating the birds. I mean, it's just lots of stuff to see, right? And so when you come out, like the dog's like a child at an amusement park. They wanna go and they wanna do every ride, they wanna do every activity, and the leash, they see the leash is standing in the way of getting to do the fun stuff. Okay. So if you want your dog to, you know, like, like be compliant on a leash, what you kind of have to do is convince the dog that leash compliance is what le leads to freedom. Okay. So we're going to walk Bear around a little bit. Okay. Walk over these lab puppies. We're going to walk Bear around a little bit. And once he shows me that he's willing to be compliant on the leash, then I'm going to let him off the leash and he's going to get to go do all the exploring that he wants and, and, and have a good time chasing Annie around, playing with these lab puppies. Okay. But he is not getting off the leash until I can trust him to be good on the leash. Because, listen guys, if a dog won't be good on the leash, you have zero chance of him being good off the leash, right? Okay. Everybody gets this confused with all the different training gadgets that are available now. Uh, let me make it as simple as possible. Good off-leash obedience comes from good on-leash obedience plus plenty of experience, okay? And so we come out here every day and we just get tons and tons of experience. Now, the more experience that the dog gets, the less overwhelming all the various types of stimulation are that we run into when we're out here. Okay, and that's something, people get so disappointed. You'll be at your training class or you'll be training at your local park and then you go hiking with your dog and your dog gives you some trouble, okay? Look, they're gonna give you this much trouble the first time, this much trouble the second time, third time, fifth time, 10th time, 20th, 30th. After a while, they're gonna acclimate and, and they're gonna mind just as well at Yosemite National Park as they do in your local park but it takes practice. And that's where everybody falls apart, in my opinion. Everybody's looking for a quick fix. There's no quick fixes in the dog business. You know, quick dog training uh, is just as effective as quick weight loss. Uh, it's not. You know, you can, you know, you can maybe put a leash on a dog and jerk their leash some, or you can get you a really novel, high value treat and, and, and give the dog, and, and kind of hold their attention for a few minutes but you know they get used to that stuff real quick right what you're after in dog training is establishing strong habits okay habit is the strongest motivator in life and that's why so many different kinds of dog training works well if it's seen through to its logical conclusion okay in dog training we're all trying to get enough successful repetitions to create habit okay we're trying to reach what's known as the habituation threshold once you get the dogs in the habit of coming when they're called, you get them in the habit of being calm and polite on the leash, then you're, you know, you can do whatever you want to. And the great thing about it is, is that the more compliant the dog is, the more freedom they get, the more freedom they get, the less they crave freedom. And so you're not in, always in this constant battle where the dog is looking at the leash as what's standing in the way of gaining access to freedom. It's the thing that guarantees access to freedom. Okay. It's really a simple concept. You know, so many people nowadays, uh, they, get, they get sold the snake oil of, uh, you know, of these, these quick fixes. No, no quick fixes. You just got to get out and, and do the work. Cameraman, go on up this trail here a little bit. And let me show you exactly what I mean. 
So this dog, I mean, he's doing pretty good for being on the leash. He's, he's kind of getting a little tired. And we use fatigue to our advantage, you know. If, um, if I come out here and a dog's giving me a little bit of a hard time about, about being good on the leash, I just walk them till they're too tired to pull, you know. Uh, so we're walking, he's starting to be pretty compliant. And I wanna add in a few elements to make sure that he understands that uh, there is never any guarantee as to how much or how little complexity is gonna be involved in our activities, okay. So I don't want anything to surprise him, okay. I, every day that I'm training, I try to incorporate some type of new and novel stimulation into our program, okay, so that the day that I, you know, saved up all my vacation days and I get to go to Yosemite National Park, someplace where there's really cool stuff that me and the dog are able to enjoy ourselves, I'm not trying to manage a dog that's overwhelmed uh, with, with activities that he thinks he needs to engage in right now. So for those of you who are familiar with my channel, you know that one of the things that I'm always looking to do is find things in the environment that challenge the dog. We call this a brush pile challenge. Now, you don't have to have a brush pile exactly like mine, but I know in your neighborhoods, there are things that if you just, you know, if you back up and you look at it from a dog's perspective or even from a child's perspective, that they can be made into super interesting obstacles, okay? It might just be a little drainage ditch, it might be a culvert, there might be some guys sawing up some logs. I don't care what it is. We get so caught up in our own biases that we have to go far away from home to have an adventure that we forget that our dogs, they haven't been around like we have. You know, this dog's a few months old. He's been on the earth for, you know, less than 300 days. So he doesn't have a lot of life experience. Climbing this brush pile for this dog, that's like me going and climbing, you know, Mount Everest. He doesn't know. Coming out here and being in my backyard where I have these trails mowed, that's like this dog getting a chance to go to Africa. Your dog could have the same experience in your environment. All you have to do is be creative with how you approach finding, uh, you know, new and novel activities. So we get out, we walk. Every so often, I, I like to think about, well, you know, what if I was walking and I saw something interesting to do? So I'll ask the dog to sit and stay. There might be some other dogs around. I'm gonna go over here, look at this interesting thing that I've seen on the trail. And I want the dog to be able to, you know, kind of just chill and relax, wait for me to get back. And here's the greatest thing about doing it this way, guys. You know, Bear, super compliant. He waited there perfectly. Okay, very nice, you're a good boy. So now he gets to do what he wants to do. So you see where the positive reinforcement is in that scenario, right? The positive reinforcement is freedom. And I can give him freedom as long as I can trust him to display behavior that's appropriate for the situation. So now I'm just gonna kind of walk around and every so often I'm gonna ask the dog to come check in with me. Every time he comes and checks in with me, well, that's like making a little deposit in the freedom uh, dispenser, okay? So I'll let him get over here and get to smelling around a little bit. And then I'm going to whistle for him. And if he comes and checks in, I'm going to give him a little treat. I give this one a treat. Well, I just give him all a treat, right? And what that treat is, that's a physical manifestation of my pleasure. It's not so much that they come back for the treat. It's that they come back to make me happy because when they make me happy, they know more good stuff's going to happen, right? And then I just take off walking. And now notice I'm not trying to micromanage everybody. I'm just out trying to have a good time myself. And when you can relax and start to have a good time, hey, your dogs are gonna do a lot better. You know, they're, they're, dogs, they really feed off of the emotion of situations. And so if you carry yourself with confidence and you look like you know what you're, what you're doing and where you're going, the dogs are gonna naturally kind of wanna, wanna tag along. So just a second ago, I had Bear and I had him on the leash and I asked him to get up on a brush pile. So cameraman, if you'll swing back there, we have another brush pile set up and I'm gonna do it this time, but I'm gonna do it minus the leash. So I'm gonna walk over here. I'm gonna whistle for Bear. Come here, Bear, come on. Oh my gosh, what a good dog. And I'm gonna get up here and start navigating this brush pile. You can do it, Bear, come on, come on. Come on, come on. 
And here comes Bear, and here comes Annie. Very nice. And so, like, I want to make all of this stuff as cooperative as possible, but none of this would be possible if I hadn't mastered, you know, my basic obedience and then tied basic obedience into freedom and, you know, put that all under an umbrella of I do awesome, cool stuff, you know. The fact that I do awesome and cool stuff is what makes these dogs want to, you know, kind of tag along. Okay, so every day I would like for you to get out and try to do some more awesome and cool stuff. Bear, come on. Very nice. And the more awesome and cool stuff that you do, well, the more the dog's going to want to hang out with you and the more effort they're going to be willing to put in to, you know, uh, navigating whatever type of physical impediment is in front of them. Very nice. Good dog. Okay, cameraman, if you want to swing around this way. Oh, no, nope, the sun's back there. Okay, so we'll keep going this way. All right, now, out of all these dogs, I wanted to show you one more. I have a little dog that's with me. And she has laid down in the shade because she gets really tired because she has a leg injury. Uh, well, it's healed now, but it didn't heal exactly right. So we're going to try to find her. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay, guys, this is Lily. Uh, Lily's an awesome little puppy, but when Lily was young, uh, she had a severe injury to her leg. Her leg was broken, and it didn't heal correctly, and so she has very limited range of motion in her leg. So when she runs, she kind of has to throw it out to the side in, a, in an arc, in a semicircle, you know, and it's very tiring. So when we're out doing our hiking, a lot of times we'll make a circuit, and as we start to make that second circuit, uh, Lily will just go to go lay down. Well, today she was a trooper. I mean, she went with us quite a bit. Uh, and then when she laid down, uh, she fell <laughs> pretty firmly asleep. And I had to walk all the way back through our little section here to find her. And then I woke her up. She's like, oh, hey, what are we doing? You know, uh, so uh, that brings us to a good point. Uh, as Lily's here over the month, uh, we'll talk some more about what to do if your dog has some type of physical impediment, something that keeps it from being able to go out and participate in the level of adventure that you would like to, you know, engage in. Uh, another thing we're going to talk about, uh, and I used to talk about this a lot, and I'm going to start talking about it again. Guys, you don't have to have a facility like mine. Okay? You don't have to have a big trail system. I mean, I've sp I spent my whole life building this facility so that people could come here and take advantage of it, but not everybody can come see me. Not everybody lives in the perfect hiking situation, okay? But the great thing is you do not need the perfect hiking situation for your puppy to think that you are going on a grand adventure. Okay. Your puppy hasn't been on this earth very long, and they have a very limited, you know, um, understanding of what constitutes the world. So that boring drive from your house to school or your house to work, that right there, there are a million opportunities on that drive to take your dog and have an adventure. A culvert, a little ditch with some dish, with some, with some you know, runoff in it, with some brush in it, a, a, a neighborhood park on a rainy day when there's nobody there. Okay, Guys, there's all kinds of adventures just waiting to be had for your puppy. If you'll just like stop thinking about adventures as having a spot like mine or stop thinking about adventures as going to Yosemite and start thinking about adventures from the lens that you use to view adventures when you were little kid okay, then you'll realize that your neighborhood is the perfect adventure zone okay and you can make it as interesting as you want to and if you'll you know and I know that's hard for some of you to pretend because it's been a long time since you've done any pretending but all you I promise all you have to do is take your puppy out and watch them watch them interact with the world and see the awe on their face see when they're smelling around here in the dirt and they're picking up a stick Everybody panics when their dog's picking up a stick when it's young, you know. Guys, the dog's having an adventure. Get out and have adventures with it. Look at Bear, you know. We might as well be like in Alaska or Africa or Costa Rica. Bear doesn't care. He just knows we're out having a good time. Annie doesn't care. She just knows we're out having a good time. So get out tomorrow. Stop making excuses. Stop saying, well, Stoney, I don't have a spot like yours or I don't live next to a good park, okay. Quit making excuses and go out and have a good time. Lead by example. The more fun you're having, the more pu fun your puppy's having. And I promise you, once you see your puppy having fun, then you're going to understand what I'm talking about. And it's going to change your whole perspective on how you know interesting your own environment is. All right. Uh, write in the comment section below and tell me about some interesting adventures you go on this week. And uh, I'll see you guys next week.